In the early 20th century, a seemingly regular American woman, Louise Peet, would quickly garner the reputation of a real-life femme fatale. Louise had the talents and skills to ensnare unsuspecting victims into her ploys, and she would leave behind her a string of deaths. Amidst her chilling list of crimes, one stands out prominently. Not only did she take a life, but she audaciously moved into the very home of her victim, seizing control of his wealth and spending it according to her whims. In today's deep dive into historical horrors, we will unravel the haunting story of Louise Peet, which will surely leave you questioning the depths to which the human mind can plunge in pursuit of its desires. On September 20th, 1880, a newspaper publisher in New Orleans and his wife welcomed a daughter whom they named Lofi Louise Pressler. Later on in life, she would come to be known as Louise Peet, taking on her middle name and the last name of her third husband, Richard Peet. As a young child, Louise was fortunate to attend an exclusive private school in New Orleans, a privilege only the wealthy had access to. However, at the school, things soon went amiss for young Louise. She got expelled at the age of 15 for multiple reports about stealing from her classmates and engaging in promiscuous behavior. Almost a decade later, Louise's life would further unravel. Her first marriage to a traveling salesman named Henry Bosley ended when he committed suicide after he caught her cheating. Louise saw his death as a sign to embrace a life of prostitution, having already cheated on Bosley multiple times during their marriage. With her eyes set on selling her body to make a living, Louise moved to Shreveport, where she worked as a high-class prostitute. Here, she returned to her previous ways of stealing, but this time she stole from her clients whenever they passed out after enjoying a round of sex with her. Soon enough, the profits Louise was getting became too small for her. She wanted more, and she wasn't going to stop at anything. To make her wishes come true, she knew she had to leave Shreveport. Within ten years of moving away from Shreveport, Louise had left a trail of shattered lives in her wake, from Boston, Massachusetts to Waco, Texas. She was the reason that two men had committed suicide, and she'd killed a man during an attempted rape. At least that was her version of the story. She had also stolen several thousand dollars in jewelry, cash and other valuables, and had several run-ins with the police. At this point, she knew she had to reinvent herself, which ultimately set her on the path to becoming the infamous serial killer she is known to be. In 1920, Louise Peet found herself once again on the move, eager to carve out a new life. This time, the destination was the vibrant city of Los Angeles, California, a significant leap of over 1,000 miles from her previous residences. Being new to the area, Louise had a housing dilemma that needed to be solved as soon as possible. As she explored potential rental properties to get one for herself, she encountered Jacob Denton, who, unbeknownst to him, would soon become entangled in her web of deception. Jacob, who was a middle-aged mining executive, owned a 14-room Tudor Revival mansion, located at 675 South Catalina Street, near Wilshire Boulevard. He had hoped to rent his home out for $350 a month while he went on a business trip some months away. At the time, Jacob was still grappling with the recent loss of his wife to the influenza epidemic that had ravaged the country and killed thousands of people. He was now a single father of one daughter, lonely and in need of companionship. Upon meeting Louise, he was instantly taken in by her southern charm, which she had perfected to a fault. While Jacob saw the possibility of companionship, Louise only saw a potential victim of her wiles. In her eyes, Jacob was the perfect target. He was vulnerable emotionally, meaning she would have it easy working her way into his heart with her cunning manipulation. He was also rich and had a massive home, which would solve her cash flow and housing issues in one stroke. After a conversation about the rental property, an agreement was struck between Louise and Jacob. For the price of $1.75 a month, other than the initial $1.350, Jacob allowed Louise to move into his home. This compromise was rumored to have been the result of an agreement that required Louise to be his live-in girlfriend and housekeeper. She later denied this claim on a number of occasions. Within a few days of moving in, Louise and Jacob got closer and closer. Soon, she started making moves for Jacob to marry her. This was a trick she had used a number of times in the past to get direct access to the riches of the men in her life. However, it proved futile on this occasion. No matter how hard she tried, Jacob never accepted her marriage ideas, as he was comfortable with the arrangement they already had. 
She concealed her annoyance at his rejection and continued to abide by their arrangement. But little did Jacob know that his seemingly harmless act of rejecting Louise would cost him more than he bargained for. On June 2nd, 1920, a little over a week after Louise moved into the mansion, Jacob disappeared. Shortly thereafter, Louise hired a gardener to transport a load of dirt into the basement. When he asked why she wanted to do so, Louise painted a picture of cultivating mushrooms for culinary purposes, which served as enough reason not to raise any eyebrows from the gardener. Three days later, Louise made a move on Jacob's money. Forging his signature, she visited the bank where he had an account to withdraw $300. She also intended to gain access to his safe deposit box, which presumably contained many valuables. However, Louise's trip to the bank almost took a different turn than she had expected. The official on duty on that day noticed Jacob's signature looked unusual, having compared it with past samples that had been received. Faced with this unexpected scrutiny, Louise devised a narrative on the spot. First, she claimed that Jacob had his right arm amputated after he was shot by an angry, mysterious Spanish-looking woman with whom he had gotten into an argument. She then alleged that the signature looked unusual because she had to help Jacob write checks and sign his name with his left hand. While the story seemed suspicious, Louise's charm and demeanor made the bank official believe her. The check was cashed, and Louise was allowed access to Jacob's security box since she had the key. Emboldened by her theft, Louise began to put into play grander plans to get more of Jacob's money. She withdrew more money from his account in the bank, pawned off his jewelry and possessions to pawn shops, and rented rooms in his mansion to different individuals. Every dime she earned from her illicit act was for her own pleasure. But soon she ran out of money and needed more. Her next move was to convince tenants of Jacob's rental properties to make their rent checks out to her. Using the guise that she was his wife, the tenants saw no need to be suspicious and subsequently made payments to her. Louise also began driving Jacob's Cadillac everywhere she went and had fully invested herself in the lie that she was his wife. When asked about Jacob's whereabouts, Louise would retell the amputation story in an emotional way and conclude with Jacob being in seclusion as he was too ashamed of his amputated arm. She also claimed that he would come out of hiding once he learned to use his artificial limbs. This excuse only lasted for a short while. Jacob's friends, daughter, business associates and neighbors began making more inquiries about his whereabouts, as it was unusual for him to be away for this long without reaching out to anyone. To placate their worries, Louise spun new stories, including one that Jacob was on an extended business trip in various locations. She also promised them that he would return shortly and address all of their concerns about his whereabouts. While others relented on making more inquiries about Jacob, his daughter remained worried and suspicious of Louise's story. Shortly after, she hired an attorney in an effort to find her father, who had now been missing for several months. The attorney questioned Louise, trying to see if there were any details that could help locate Jacob. He ended up finding nothing helpful, as Louise claimed that she had no idea where Jacob had traveled to. However, she agreed to forward his financial and business documents as soon as possible to help with the investigation, which she never did. At this point, the pressure was building up on Louise. She was the last person known to have seen Jacob and the only person he was living with at the time of his disappearance. It was obvious to her that her stories were no longer adding up and becoming less and less believable, and soon enough, accusing fingers began to be pointed at Louise with regard to Jacob's disappearance. Rather than remain in this tense situation, Louise decided it was time to move away. Telling no one, she quietly rented out the mansion and ran back to Denver, where she had left an estranged husband, Robert Pete, and a daughter, Betty. Prior to her flight, Louise had not allowed anyone to carry out a search of the mansion, but with her away, it was now possible to do so. Using the help of her attorney, Jacob's daughter hired a private detective to search the home for any details that could help solve the mystery of Jacob's disappearance. Each of the 14 rooms of Jacob's mansion was searched thoroughly. The toilets, baths, kitchens, pantries, sheds, and other spots in the house were also searched with the same vigor. However, nothing interesting was found until the search reached the basement. Here, the private detective hired by Deaton's daughter found his decomposing body buried in the basement, in a wooden cubicle under the stairs. It was bound with numerous cords and wrapped in a quilt. When the quilt was removed, all four limbs of Jacob were intact. 
meaning Louise's story about Jacob having an amputation was false. The cops were then invited, and they removed Jacob's body to the morgue, where an autopsy was carried out. The result revealed that he had been shot in the head and strangled, although it was unclear which of the acts came first. The discovery of Jacob's decomposing body led to an all-out search for Louise. All her acquaintances were questioned, but none of them could give any details as to her whereabouts. It would take a while, but the police eventually tracked Louise to Denver, where she had slithered back into the comfort of married life with her husband and daughter. Upon being questioned about Jacob's murder, Louise informed the police that she had no awareness that there was a basement in the house. She also claimed that she was not involved, but offered different scenarios to explain his death. First, she resorted to her unidentified mysterious Spanish woman story, which she told when Jacob's absence was first noticed. This theory was quickly dismissed, as Jacob's body was found with all of his limbs still attached, contradicting Louise's earlier claim that Jacob was in hiding because he was embarrassed about his missing arm. Next, Louise claimed that the body was not that of Jacob, but that of someone whom he had killed. This theory also fell on deaf ears because, although the body was decomposing when it was found, the autopsy revealed that it shared many similarities with Jacob. Eventually, when Louise's home closet was searched, the silver fur items of clothing and other valuables belonging to Jacob were discovered in her possession. Additionally, the gun that was used in committing the crime was found, which confirmed that she masterminded the death of Jacob. Louise was then arrested and brought back to Los Angeles. She was indicted on one charge of first-degree murder. Despite her situation being exposed, Louise never admitted to killing Jacob. It remained unclear why she did so, whether it was due to a lover's spat, a whim, or to give herself full access to Jacob's wealth. Her trial began on January 21st, 1921. Thousands of people would often fill the streets and sidewalks during the trial just to catch a glimpse of the infamous female murderer. Her trial was also extensively covered by newspapers nationwide. Over the course of the trial, several pieces of evidence were presented by the prosecutors to convince the jury that Louise was guilty. Meanwhile, the defense argued that there were people other than Louise who could have committed the crime if indeed a crime was committed. They also claimed that the prosecutor's evidence was largely circumstantial and shouldn't determine the fate of Louise. In his closing remarks, the leading prosecutor in charge of the case asked the jury that extreme measures be applied to punish Louise for her crimes. He said, having proved the defendant guilty of a cold-blooded, premeditated murder, that she shot Jacob like a coward in the back and robbed his body while it was warm, the people of the state of California ask you, gentlemen of the jury, to find her guilty and inflict the extreme penalty of the law. The extreme penalty in this case was to sentence Louise to death. However, the jury chose to be lenient, recommending life imprisonment instead. While Louise did not testify in the trial, she spoke with the press once, saying she was being crucified her exact words were, I am being crucified upon a cross. But I can say, as did Christ, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Subsequently, she filed motions for a new trial, hoping to get the judgment evacuated in an appeal. This move didn't work, and she had to settle into life as a prisoner at San Quentin State Prison before being transferred to the California Institution for Women in Tehachapi. All through the trial, Louise's husband, Richard, stood by her, he also paid her visits while she was in prison for the first two years of her sentence, as he believed she was innocent. However, for unknown reasons, he committed suicide in 1924, leaving their daughter in the care of his family. While in prison, Louise worked as a dental assistant, maintained the prison's flower garden, and wrote for the prison newspaper. All this, including her reputation as a model prisoner, led to something that was not initially possible at the start of her sentencing. After serving 18 long years for killing Jacob, Louise was paroled for good behavior in 1939. Coming out of prison, Louise got married to banker Lee Borden, who had no idea she was previously imprisoned for murder. Soon after, she began working for an elderly couple, Arthur and Margaret, known as the Logan family. But once again, Louise relapsed into her old ways of making up sinister plans. She began telling neighbors that Arthur had fits of rage and physically attacked her and Margaret on several occasions. On June 1, 1944, Margaret disappeared. Three days later, Arthur was committed to Patton State Hospital by Louise, 
who claimed to be his foster sister. When neighbors and Louise's husband began asking about Margaret's whereabouts, she claimed that Arthur had attacked his wife in a frenzy and bitten her nose so severely that she was left disfigured and no longer wanted to be seen in public. As she had with Jacob, Louise began spending the Logan's money and forging their names on checks. However, after several instances of withdrawals, employees at the Logan's bank detected one of the forgeries Pete made and called the police. While investigating the forgery, police searched the Logan home that Louise and her husband had moved into like it was their own. During the course of the investigation, they discovered the decomposing body of Margaret, buried in a shallow grave under an avocado tree in the backyard. The case of forgery quickly turned into one of murder, as Louise was arrested and charged a few hours after the discovery. Once again, Louise cooked up a new story about not being involved in the murder of Margaret. She claimed that Arthur had killed her during a homicidal frenzy. She then admitted to burying her but said she did not report to the police because of her previous conviction. An autopsy later determined that Margaret had been shot in the back of the neck and had sustained a skull fracture. Despite Louise's denial, all the clues pointed to her, especially because she had taken control of Logan's family money as her own. Upon being taken to jail, Louise's husband Borden killed himself, unable to face the shame of being associated with her. During Louise's trial, there was no recommendation for mercy, as the prosecutor made sure the jury knew about Louise's previous conviction. In no time, she was found guilty again of first-degree murder. When it came to sentencing, Louise was given the death penalty. She tried to appeal several times, but it all ended in vain. On the 25th anniversary of Jacob's death, that day finally arrived. Louise was taken out for her final moments before being executed in California's gas chamber. Back in jail, she smiled sadly and once again denied every murder she had committed during her lifetime. Her words were, I have never killed or even harmed a human being, but the truth is elusive. <laughs>